Well, Dr. Johnny Kim, welcome to the podcast. And uh, as we say, prepare yourself for the hard truth. Uh, I assure you, this is not going to be as daunting uh, as becoming a SEAL, a Harvard-educated doctor, or an astronaut. Uh, think of it as an icebreaker for you and the uh, the listeners. All right, so just give us the, the most authentic, natural answer as it comes to you. What book are you currently reading? Any takeaways from that book? Uh, I am listening to the audiobook, Can't Hurt Me. And the reason why I'm smiling is that I actually never read or listen to SEAL books. And I'm just doing this because a, a friend uh, gave it to me, um, but I'm, I'm currently listening to that. Well, we have something in common. I steer away from SEAL books as well. Uh, I didn't even read my, uh, my own book. What's your favorite podcast? I, I don't listen to podcasts. Good answer. Okay. What, what does your uh, workout and diet program uh, look like? Is that controlled by, uh, by NASA? No, um, there's a lot of freedom. I, you know, I used to be a little bit more strict. I was into CrossFit for a long period of time. I now just kind of stick with the regimented str uh, strength training program. I just, you know, the main compound lifts, squats, deadlifts, presses, bench presses, and then do some cardio, whether it's running or sprints. So uh, nothing too regimented there. Um, and as far as diet, I, what, I think maybe I intermittently fast, but not because I do it for the maybe health benefits, just because it seems to be more convenient for my particular lifestyle at the moment. Uh, no, nothing crazy. I, just a healthy amount of fats, proteins, meats, fruits, vegetables, standard stuff. Right on. Well, you look great. So whatever you're doing, you're doing well. I, 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 sleep's a big one for me. Uh, I'm sure it's a big one for you. How much sleep do you get a night? It's a perfect time you ask that. I've been actually trying to be more intentional with my sleep. I would say for long periods of time, I was averaging five and a half, five to five and a half. And, and maybe more recently, more six and six and a half. But I'm actually trying to good, get a good seven hours of sleep moving forward. Wait, when you say intentional, what are the little things you're doing? I think most important for me is to be intentional about my bedtime. Um, and for me, that is, uh, you know, just going to sleep early uh, so that I have an early wake up time. And so my early wake up time is pretty fixed. I like to keep it that way. And so for me to get more sleep, then I just need to be more intentional about going to sleep earlier. I hear you. Good, good advice. What app do you utilize most on your cell phone? Arguably it's gotta be YouTube and Reddit, mostly because those two platforms, you can pretty much learn anything. Uh, I think the power of the internet, if you wanna learn new skill, learn about something that you just don't know about, you can go to those two platforms. That and Wikipedia. So you're always learning. You're always looking for content that adds value to your life. Absolutely. I mean, if you're not learning, it's like you're not really living. I think we should all posture ourselves to be lifelong learners for, for entirety until we die. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. What is your favorite song? What's that song you put on before the missions that uh, when you were a SEAL? Danzig. It was uh, Mother by Danzig. It was my, my song. You know, I get jocked up, get the ammo, load up. That was, that was my song, so I think I had to stick with that. Favorite movie? Uh, Gattaca. It's really nerdy, but that was, uh, that was a movie that I liked even before I became, like decades before I even thought of being an astronaut. No kidding. I, I know what you're talking about. I was going to give a one-liner because I don't think I, – I have actually – most people I meet, even at NASA, have never even heard or watched the movie. Uh, the one-liner for that is just some poor, sm some poor soul who was born with inferior – I guess inferior genetics. It's like a futuristic world where everything is based on genetics. On, and so he – this kid was born with inferior genetics but has a dream of becoming an astronaut and going to the rings of Saturn. And basically, it's his life. The movie's about his life and the grit he has to go through to push past all of his uh, so-called superiorly genetic colleagues. Johnny, I've got to ask then, because one, genetically, you're not inferior by any means. But did you find a commonality in that movie, given that you, you know, were I, a first-generation American? You know, I think that's probably why I like the movie so much. Is that I even. When I first watched it, I was 16 or 17 in science class. Uh, Mr. Gaughan, actually my biology teacher, showed it to us. And there was something about it that I think I identified with even as a teenager, of just being the underdog. And uh, I, I, I think I longed, you know, maybe identified with certain aspects of this character um, who, who had huge aspirations, but was unfortunately born into a shell of a person 
where he was told, you're not allowed to do any of things. You're not qualified to do any of these, of these things because you don't have the, ge the genetics for it. And so he puts himself through excruciating training and procedures to fool everyone. And he ends up being better at the job than anyone else, despite what his genetics say he's limited to. So I think that idea of not having a glass ceiling has appealed to me even a young, as a young teenager. And even to this day, it's been my favorite movie. Well, I have no doubt the uh, sales of that movie shortly after this comes out are going to uh, skyrocket. Okay, Dr. Johnny Kim's biggest pet peeves. What, what drives you up a wall? I really am negatively affected by disingenuous people or when I see good people being manipulated, I think that strikes a nerve for me. Johnny, that's interesting. Uh, you know, I'm writing a book right now with a few other guys on culture and leadership, and we asked for the definition of leadership, and you'd be surprised how many people say leadership is to manipulate others to your will, which they probably intentionally are not meaning, but it's uh, interesting how much that comes out. So I don't disagree with that. I think we could probably talk a little bit about this. Um, so it may be semantics if you getting a team to buy in with your goals to invigorate to inspire them to make them find the strength within themselves to achieve something i think it might be semantics to say well that's manipulation that's the other side of the coin i think the difference what and maybe i can clarify is manipulation towards ill intent for self-gain manipulating others for self-gain is what I was thinking of and um, didn't even think to clarify because I think the word manipulation has a really negative connotation. Um, but I think the way you described it, leadership in some ways is a form of that. But I think maybe naturally I don't think of it that way because it is moving in a direction that's for the better good. I love how you define that. Yes, manipulation for self-purpose. Uh, or for self uh, desires, but uh, you know, I usually like to default to the word inspire, to inspire others to action, to inspire others to uh, to buy in. On the in in that vein, who's the most influential mentor that you've ever had? You know, I I've had a lot of flawed mentors, um, but the key word is influential, and and someone that I for me means someone that I've learned a lot from. And uh, so, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't say it was um, some of the commanders I had in the SEAL teams. And the one that comes to the top of my head, of course, is Jocko. Amazing. And who would be the best leader you ever worked for? Could be the same answer. It's not the same answer for me because um, every leader I've worked for has had flaws. Every one of them. And uh, I worked for you, Mike, and you have been extremely influential, and I've learned so much from you. Um, but I think you'll be the first to agree with me that you are a flawed leader. I'm certainly a flawed person and a leader. Every single person I've worked for and have learned from has been flawed. And I've learned so much from each of them. So I don't have a best leader that I've worked for. Beautiful answer, and, and so true. What is your top bucket list item. And funny enough, the way this is phrased, this next part, it's the thing you must do before you leave this earth. And I'm not talking on a rocket ship. I'm talking leave the earth as in the bib biblical sense. I think just the way my brain is wired, I don't think it, I have never made a bucket list. And uh, thinking about it, I don't have a bucket list. I am happy. I, I think maybe I don't have one because I think the idea of a bucket list suggests you're putting something off that's really, really important for you. But I feel like if there's something that important for you, why aren't you grabbing it right now? And so for me, what I think about before I die is that I have had, I have moved the needle towards progress and have impacted as much as I've wanted to impact the lives of other people and the world in a positive way. And if I feel I haven't done all I can for that, then I will be dissatisfied before I leave this earth. That's what I think about. But I don't think I have a bucket list in the natural way people think about it. It's like, you know, I got to visit all, you know, climb all the major mountains and, and things like that. I don't think I have something like that. Johnny, that is an amazing answer. And uh, I think it's a reflection that you live in the now. 
and you don't wait to seize uh, what uh, what brings you happiness or what you know will impact others around you. Here's the uh, the final question, Johnny. If you could go back and talk to your 20 year old self for one minute, what would you tell yourself? Uh, you know, that's not a lot of time. So I would I would say that confidence and humility are some of the most important traits to maximize your ability to learn from other people. And that includes successes and mistakes that other people make. And also telling that 20 year old Johnny, cause that 20 year old Johnny had a very narrow definition of what leadership was and what strength was. And it was mostly what was um, glorified and applauded in the SEAL teams. And that is a very good set of skills in leadership in that context. I would tell that 20 year old self that true leadership and uh, has an expanded tool set that is much wider than that 20 year old Johnny may think, uh, which at the time was mostly, um, I think physical strength and mental strength and, lead and leading in a combat type of context. It's uh, sometimes it just takes time. And uh, you've, you know, part of that process is failure is the, the foundation of all success. So I love that answer. And actually, Johnny, you hit on it. You talked about confidence and you were officially off the hot seat. That's the, uh, the hard truth. I think the listeners have a better idea of who uh, Dr. Johnny Kim is besides the articles, the countless articles that come out on you. I want to move to, uh, to confidence, which actually I'm going to approach from the direction of self-doubt. Now, I read something in the Harvard uh, Gazette, and it was a great, great interview with you. And uh, I think that you said you shared that you have self-doubt in your younger years. And I think this is something that all high performers possess to some degree, even those that have accomplished so much uh, as yourself. But in high school, you said you did not see in yourself the qualities you admired in others. The courage of the astronauts whose posters were on your wall the quiet professionalism and the odd defying determination of the special forces. Would you say that you had a healthy do dose of, uh, of self doubt in your younger years? No, I think I had an unhealthy dose of self doubt. I think, well, I think it served me well. I think it served me from ever becoming arrogant and feeling like I was always on thin ice of becoming unworthy to being among my teammates. So when I, you know, as an adolescent, I was, I really had no confidence. I was scared of social situations. I was scared to talk to people. I was scared of confrontation, any kind of confrontation. I would always react and, and take actions to avoid confrontations, even if it was at the cost of myself, um, either from a social situation or if I had to do extra work. Um, I mean, like little things like, hey, maybe you're on a school project in high school and, and one person is not, maybe you're doing most of the majority of the work, but you're unwilling to speak up because you just want to avoid confrontation. So you're just willing to do it. That, that was the kind of kid I was. And I wanted to be a SEAL more than anything. And for me and Buds, I cared so much about what my teammates and my boat crew thought more than the instructors because I wanted to belong. And I wanted to be worthy to be in their presence because I felt that I was honored. I was the, I was the lucky one to be even given a chance to be in their presence and passing buds. I mean, there were these incremental stages of gaining more confidence and realizing, Hey, maybe the person that I thought I was this weak, scared individual is not as weak as timid as I thought I was. And, but always having that sense of self doubt, even in the SEAL teams, where I felt that I had to perform to earn my keep in the platoon. And I felt maybe that I had to perform even more than others to keep, because I wasn't the strongest guy and not the biggest guy. You know, when you think of a Navy SEAL, you certainly probably don't think of someone of my stature, but a lot of those things played into my confidence and that kind of kept me on edge of always feeling like I had to perform. And so I think it served me well but I don't think it was what I would say healthy level of confidence. I think I had probably an un unhealthy level and that followed me even outside the teams and to other occupations when I was going to school, grad school, medical school. But I think it eventually became maybe more of a healthy level of, of, of self doubt. Um, but I would say that now I've evolved it to be a rather healthy level of 
doubt, and I don't even know if doubt is the right word for it. I think maybe um, healthy level of confidence and knowing that I'm fallible and I'm going to make mistakes, but if I own them, if I'm accountable, I'm going in the right direction. And so I think I have more grace for myself. Beautiful. So having gone through SEAL training with you and having watched you go to Iraq two times in the Battle of Ramadi in 2006 and again, the Battle of Sadr City in 2008, did going to war help erode at that sense of, uh, of self-doubt? Or as you say, did it help regulate it? It certainly, I think it helped. Um, uh, that's a really good question. I don't think I've ever thought of it like that. What helped was certainly in 2006 in the combat. I mean, we had contact, we, we engaged almost every single mission we went out on. And realizing, you know, you don't really, when you're in a bubble, and when I say in a bubble is because everyone in that platoon and the task unit were, we were all very aggressive warriors. We, we seeked the challenge. We were good, we were high performers. I think you kind of assume everything is like that and everyone is like that. So the experiences we had didn't, weren't realized at the time that, oh, these were maybe outside the norm experiences for what a regular deployment is or what a regular level of combat is or stress is. And you're going through and you're doing the best you can. And maybe at some point realizing, hey, most people don't have these types of experiences and we're extremely resilient people and I think that kind of self-discovery and is really important and I think can really inspire yourself, inspire other people. I mean, that, that those combat tours were certainly roads of self-discovery about my weaknesses, my what I'm fallible to, but also that humans are extremely resilient individuals when faced with a challenge. In that same article, you talked about something that, again, I know I still struggle with. You talked about comparison, people comparing themselves to other, which we probably, we, we do at a greater rate with social media. Uh, and you talked about how comparison is the thief, thief of, uh, of happiness. How do you handle that? Do you still compare yourselves to others or have you fully accepted that you're on your own path? And what advice would you, would you have for people that are, are, are struggling with that very notion? So when I... So I, I certainly agree with that statement, and it's not my. I think I, I don't remember where I first heard you know comparisons to the thief of happiness, but I heard it's one of those statements where you hear you're know, like, oh, that is that is completely on point, and I agree with you. In the world we live in, in uh, with social media, I think it's a tool for good, but in a lot of ways can be a tool for comparing yourself with the successes of other people, and I think that is not a good, healthy way mentally. Um, and it's also not accurate or, or genuine. We talked about being genuine. I don't. Th I mean, people are fallible. That's what I love about working in an organization like NASA, uh, working with great teammates and high performers, is that we recognize that we fail all the time, and we embrace those failures. To answer your question, I don't compare myself with other people in that respect. But what I do like to, I don't know if compare is the right word, but certainly we. There are things that we can work on, our own quality traits, and maybe it's technical skills, but I'm not even talking technical skills. I'm talking maybe more interpersonal skills or soft skills or leadership skills. But there are other people who have, who are better at certain things than we are. And so learning from them, watching them, understanding them, learning uh, and talking to them, I think that is in a way comparing yourself to other people. and. I find myself to do that frequently in, uh, in a lot of things. And, uh, and that's what we talked about having had leaders and mentors previously that I've all been flawed, but they've all had great strengths in certain things and being able to compare yourself and how you might be able to incorporate that into your own being so that you can make the best version, the best genuine version of yourself. And I find, my, I find myself doing that a lot, um, but it's not comparing, oh, this person has this, or this person is in position of this, I wish I had that. I think that is kind of, um, that can be unsustainable and unhappy. I, I think I call that modeling. There's, there's a lot of people such as yourself that, that I, I admire. And again, I, I look at your strengths and I try to model myself or emulate uh, 
you know, your strengths in order to, to increase whatever attributes or soft skills that I'm trying to, uh, to improve. But I, I completely agree with you um, from a standpoint. And I know you've talked about this in the past is that you want your kids to understand they're on their own path. Cause I know if I was the, uh, the son of Dr. Johnny Kim, I would have some, some very high hurdles to meet uh, to, to, to emulate what he did in life. What do you say to your kids uh, in terms of following their own path and seeking happiness, whatever that means to them. I, you know, and I say frequently to my 10 year old, you know, I intentionally, um, actually never told my children what I, what I did for a while. Um, uh, my son, my oldest son eventually found out I was a seal. Um, and I think my heart was in the right place and why I didn't want him to know, um, because I didn't want to have any, any aspect of that life glorified. But I think in doing so, I maybe just made it worse or had the actual counter effect. And the reason being is I saw a book he had checked out as a third grader, and it was about Navy SEALs. It was like a third grade book level about Navy SEALs. And it was endearing to me, um, but at the same time, not at all what I wanted. And because it's important for me that we all make our own mark in this world, and we all make that mark in the way we want to. And there's no tried and true path on how to do that. And I think I might be affected because my own father was very strict on what he thought success meant. He had a very clear definition of it and it was not consistent with what I wanted. And that led to a lot of internal conflict, internal and external conflict. And I didn't want that same burden to be on my own children because I don't think that everyone, anyone should ever have to live in anyone's shadow. And the very fact that we have to entertain that we're somehow measured against our parents or measured against other people is just a not, it's not a right way of thinking. And so what I tell my children is that my only request is that they are passionate and put their all into whatever they want to do. But I have I care not what it is. If it's military, if they want to go into business, be an artist, I don't care. Johnny, you, you've talked about how the SEALs have been an integral uh, part of your life. Do you consider your time in the Navy SEALs some of your most, let's call it formative years in your adult life? Absolutely. It is easily the most formative years of my life by, by an order of magnitude. I could probably go into, I mean, why I think I, you know, I think about this is that I feel that the person I am today is because of those formative years. And the question I deal with is, could I have become the person I am today with the perspectives I have and the tools I have without having to go through those life changing, extreme, and also traumatic experiences? And I don't know the answer, but I think the answer is it's not possible in the time frame that I did it in. And I think it's because when you go through such extreme circumstances, so, such extreme experiences that test your very being, that test your resiliency, that test your grit, that make you scared for your own life and the life of other people, those are extreme human emotions, like the most extreme. And it's like it compresses all of life's lessons into, you know, like time compresses them in a way that's digestible for you to live the rest of your life. And so to answer your question, absolutely, those are the most formative years of my life. I think they'll be, I think they will serve me for the rest of my life as the most formative lessons. I will ever have learned about humanity, about leadership, about sacrifice. And I can't think of another way to have learned those same lessons, especially in that time frame. Now, are you speaking holistically of your entire time in the, in the SEAL teams or what was more impactful, the, the actual SEAL training or your time at war? What, what do you think oh, had the-, the... Oh, without a, without a doubt. It was the war. Uh, I mean, so we, 
When we progress through life, we have benchmarks of what we think we're capable of or our experiences. And so that, that bar gets raised every time you pass that threshold. And every time you raise that bar, you get a new high, you think that that's it. Or maybe there's nothing more extreme or more you can learn until you hit that next high. And then you realize that your previous benchmark, like, oh, well, that was actually not that high to begin with. And I would say probably in Hell Week, right? So, you know, going through Hell Week, you're tested. I mean, you're up five and a half days. It sucks. It's really a lot of suffering. And you think, wow, I can do anything. I've looked, you know, maybe there's a little bit of hubris there. Like, oh, I've gone through the most toughest training. I can do anything in this world. And then you realize it's that hard because combat experiences, wartime experiences, those human experiences are that much more difficult and worse. And so the closest thing you can get to that is to make training very, very difficult. But it's a drop in the bucket of what the real war was. And so, yeah, I think up until training, I thought that that was um, certainly a lot of development as a leader, as a follower, as a teammate. But paled in comparison to the lessons I learned overseas. Let's go back to Hell Week. Because again, you know, when you went on Jocko Podcast 221, I teared up. You, you, you talked about your, your childhood and time previous to the SEAL teams for about an hour with, uh, with Jocko. And I remember reaching out to a, a, a good uh, friend of ours who, who we won't mention his name. And I said, hey, did you know this about Johnny? And, and you had internalized it. And, and I actually felt like a bad friend for not knowing your full story. Now, in an interview, you mentioned that during Hell Week, you had a moment where you thought you were, you, you were going to give up and say, hey, I quit. But having been in Hell Week with you, I never saw that in you whatsoever. Do, do you remember what moment that was? Yeah, I do. Um... It means a lot to me to hear you say those things too, Mike. Um, I will answer your question, but my first, you may not remember this. My first memory of you was administering the PRT. Do you remember? I don't know. You were one of the, you know, the officers administering the PRT for, well, I don't know if you were, but you had a clipboard and at least maybe had, I don't think you were administering it, but you had the results of it. And I, I had to like crush the swim and you were like, you know, like, Johnny, like, F yeah. And I was like, that was the biggest boost for me because I knew your story. I knew you were a recon marine, a sergeant in recon marines. Uh, you know, you were one of the most respected officers. You and Nick Norris uh, were up there. And so it meant a lot to me. I remember that. And so I just remember looking up to you at such a young age. And I was really young when I went to young and impressionable, showing up to Buds. And so I remember uh, Mike Strelly, you know, a lot, of, a lot of good and fun memories. Uh, and you, you know, you performed really well in Hell Week. I felt, I really felt like Hell Week was for me to prove my value to my teammates because I don't think, and I know I wasn't a top performer. I was a middle of the pack, middle to slower pack runner. Um, my O course wasn't super great. Um, you know, my, my under the log, I felt mediocre, but I just knew that I could give heart. It's like that movie Rudy, you know, just Rudy wasn't born into maybe the most athletic body, but he had heart more than anything. And I really felt that if I could show how much sacrifice I'm willing to put in, I will be loved and accepted by my teammates. And I was. Um, I have a really fond memory of Czech, Nick Czech, and uh, I think it's okay that I say his name because um, he's no longer with us. And um, and his and our you know Steve is his like best friend who was also in. The, in um, in our boat crew, and uh, I really wanted their approval, and uh, he gave me that, and he, he told me that I belonged there, and it meant a lot to me. Um, so, you know, love you, Chuck, um, wherever you are. So going back, uh, the the moment that I was at my weakest, uh, certainly during Buds, was remember how they get that two-hour nap in that warm cot, and then they wake you up by whispering in your ear to go hit the surf and it completely disarms your ability to ramp a fight or flight response. And so that was, I think, ingenious on the instructor's part, but <laughs> had none of those 
none of the adrenaline run, running and just got into that really cold water. And that was certainly my weakest moment because just woken up and you're completely disarmed, which I think is, in, is it's just awesome, right? It's just that feeling weak and having your teammates. I mean, no other place you'd rather be, but uh, certainly <laughs> was a moment of weakness for me. Um, and I don't think I was like, imagine myself getting up, but I was like, man, I really, really, this is, this is hard for me. <laughs> You, you use the word disarm. I, I, I would use for me was disorientating. And, and since you have a medical background, you probably understand this, but uh, you know, I never asked you because you get a, another opportunity to sleep later in hell week. I remember I chose not to sleep. Uh, the only way in sort of non-medical terms that I can explain it is you don't go into REM. So that, that two hours they give you is not helpful. It actually made me feel worse. Um, I, I don't know if you felt the, uh, the same way. I, you know, I actually have a memory of you being up um, talking to the instructors. Yeah, it's funny. I just I hadn't thought of that until you said it. Um, but that was pretty smart of you <laughs> because I don't think that two hours, that two hour nap helped at all. I think, like you said, I think it just maybe made things worse. It, I think it's just because I don't know if you had this experience, but when they secured Hell Week, I felt that all of the trauma to our bodies caught up because the brain subconsciously said, I am done. The bar, you, you, you have the body, like the body's yours again. And it just started breaking apart. Like you, where you had just run at full speed with boats over your head from the demo pits. And now you couldn't hop, you couldn't walk over the berm without limping. I mean, I remember that it was like, it was immediate. And so certainly I, I can see those two hours not, not being that helpful. It was, uh, you know, I could not be more proud of our class. And for the Listeners, uh, Nick Check uh, was killed on a hostage rescue. He was awarded the uh, the Navy Cross, and uh, I actually was a part of that mission as the IRF commander and watched him just leave the rest of his team in the dirt to be the number one man through the door and just chose to go down the uh, the, the wrong wall. But that's a testament uh, to Nick. And then thank you for putting me in the same sentence as Nick Norris. Uh, you two are cut from the same cloth. I've never met men that are more successful, uh, stand out from their peers, yet remain humble and uh, more compassionate and empathetic of their, uh, their fellow humans. I'm honored. Well, one, I would say, um, yeah, I feel like Nick Norris and I don't belong in the same sentence, but Mike, I, I actually, I didn't know that. I didn't know that you were with Nick. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm sure we could talk offline. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was not on the ground, but we were in the, uh, we were, we were prepared to, uh, to, to support, you know, Johnny, you're talking a lot about, again, the, the title of this podcast is Truth Plus Tribe, and tribe means everything to me. Um, you know, I've often found, and I'd love to get your, your input on this, I've often found that I've learned more from the SEALs to my left and, and, and my right, peers. You and I were peers uh, than, than the traditional higher-up mentors that you usually have. Um, it, you know, it goes along with the proverb, uh, iron sharpens iron, so is one man sharpens another. Do you feel you learn more from your peers in the SEAL teams, or do you learn more from your traditional mentors? Uh, absolutely, from from my peers. Um, I certainly. So I think I, I would. I learned well, certainly in my peers at the same level, and then one level removed from that. So at the OIC level of the platoon, the AOIC, um, and so that's why I, I was thinking when you were saying influential mentor, because Jocko was two levels removed from me, right? So he was Leif and then Jocko. Um, the reason why I did say his name, though, is because I have certainly, I, I find that a lot of the way that I treat, that I conduct myself and behave myself in interpersonal relationships and in leadership and followerships is indirectly attributed, or not indirectly, but I think indirectly attributed by him um, through some of the commanders that I worked for. And so um, I see elements of that. But again, I think we make the best versions for ourselves when we incorporate, when we take in those best elements of our leaders and the people we work with into our own being to make that us, to make that you, because you got to do you at the end. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, I've learned so much more from my own peers and their own struggles and failures, um, really, um, in, just, in just in life in general. Now, have you found that same peer-to-peer -peer mentorship at NASA to, to, to the same degree more? Uh, what, what does that look like within those walls? 
I think it is similar. Certainly when we were a class, so when we first showed up, we had two years of initial astronaut training. And like a class that's going through a military training, we did a lot of things together. I think learning from each other was really, really important. Um, there is also some top-down um, learning from there, but it's not. it wasn't as apparent when I first showed up. And when I eventually get assigned, I think I will be back in that kind of relationship. But NASA is interesting. It's probably really similar to the structure of a special operations team. There's a lot of peer-led leadership here. And I think in a lot of ways, that is a lot more difficult than your typical chain of command type of spelled out leadership. And the reason why peer leadership is so important and I think more difficult is because you need to be able to read the room, so to speak, be able to have that emotional social intelligence to flex on when to act as a leader and when to act as a peer and to, to scale those skills back. Um, that I think is pretty tricky. And, but the people I work with here at NASA, not just astronauts, but people on the ground that are flight controllers, do that immensely well. You, Johnny, you bring that up. It's pretty interesting. Two individuals that have been influential uh, on my development as a leader, uh, and I'm writing a book with them, Brian Decker, former uh, Special Forces officer who's now the Director of Player Development for the Indianapolis Colts, and then Rich Devinney, a former SEAL commander, author of The, uh, the Attributes. Um, they both observe that if you walk up on a special operations team, uh, you know, the general public thinks that you'd see a, a Jocko yelling orders and it's clearly, you know, he's the leader of the organization. But what they found uh, bringing psychologists in is the psychologist couldn't identify who the clear leader was. And as Rich Devinney explains it, there's this almost alpha swapping, as you said, that a peer steps up and leads maybe because they have more corporate knowledge in that arena or they have a higher technical skill. But the second that is done, somebody else steps up again because they're better at that task. And they do it without having to formally say, hey, Johnny, you're leading right now. I'm following. And then, uh, and then you know, again, formally declaring when that's over and when you're following me. Um, but interesting uh, observation. And, and I know in past uh, interviews, you, you've you know, you've said that the SEALs became the foundation of what teamwork should look like uh, in life. I'm interested, and there's no negative answer here one way or the other. Some people identify as individuals, and that's okay. Uh, you know, I think, you know, pilots, uh, you know, fighter pilots identify more as an individual than they do as a team player, and maybe I'm p painting them in a negative light. Um, and others paint themselves as team uh, team players. Where does Johnny, Johnny Kim fall in on that uh, on that spectrum? Do you identify as a team player more so than an individual? I mean, so absolutely. To, so to answer your question, I absolutely identify myself more as more as a team player. I mean, we're always um, better than the summation of our parts. But it, it's an interesting question. I think um, I think you can have elements of both. You can own both. And I'm, I'm just kind of forming my thoughts here and listening to that. Um, I was kind of internally smelling when you made that comment about fighter because I have a lot of friends that are pilot pilots now. And, and they're some of the best teammates um, I've had. But what they do own is individual skills and technical skills and knowing where they fall in the lineup. Because, I mean, let's just stick with that example. Fighter pilots don't go on a mission by themselves, unless you're like a, maybe a big bomber. You know, they're they're going out as part of a squadron they they have you know they have people on the wings tails they are a unit together and so i think we need to be comfortable we need to be secure with ourselves to act as individual units but we need to be able to cohese to integrate with the team and that example you gave the special operations unit of you know when they studied it from a psychological perspective they couldn't tell who was the leader that that strikes me as really interesting it's interesting because when you think about that kind of unit, you think of a lot of type A, alpha-centric operators. And you have to realize that for someone to be able to step into a role of leadership like that, or to peel back as more of a follower, it's a really dynamic, it's very dynamic, and you need secure operators, people, individuals who are secure with where they are. No ego, no narcissism, and they are okay being a cog in the larger machine. And I think that's good. You need to, be, you need to own that you can be a cog. Um, you can be an individual. Um, but recognize at the end of the day for the mission, for the betterment of 
of the mission, of the team, of humanity, that you are a cog in a greater machine. So the answer is absolutely to identify myself as more of a more of a teammate, but I think you could have elements of both. Uh, you've just shaped my perception on that, and that's the beauty of these podcasts is as a leader, I'm always evolving, I'm always learning. Thank you for, for teaching me something there, honestly. Um, Johnny, I, I do want to talk quickly about the uh, the Battle of Vermont and the Battle of Sauter City and um, how that impacted uh, using human, both good and bad, because we saw some inspirational things. And then I saw, I think we saw the worst in man uh, as well, uh, usually from the other side. Let me let me start this with an observation for the, uh, the listeners, uh, having known you and being there with you both times. Uh, in Ramadi, I watched you within the span of, I don't know, 15, 30 minutes, run into the line of fire to pull a wounded Iraqi soldier to safety. And then not only did you do that, which I'm sure, you know, having rounds pinging all around you, your, your adrenaline was through the, uh, the roof. You then transitioned to life-saving medicine or medical procedures to try and resuscitate that, uh, that same soldier. And I remember watching, and I know that was unsuccessful, how personally you took that. And, you know, as I watched you evolve on the battlefield, namely Ramadi, I could not have been more awestruck and prideful uh, of what you had become in such a short period of time. You, you know, that was your first deployment, and I would have guessed you had five deployments under your belt. You performed exceptionally at war, and nobody will ever take that away from you. But I also saw a change in you following the death of Mark Lee and Ryan Job, and I don't mean that in a negative way. You still went on to war, another battle, the Battle of Sadr City, and you still performed exceptionally but there's something i couldn't quite put my finger on there was something that i i could see in your eye and, and quite frankly you didn't smile as much i know again that in an interview you said you felt helpless to do more for ryan job when he was shot in the face and that that eventually drove you to take your medical uh training your your medical profession uh, further could you talk to me about the impacts uh, of both mark and ryan's death on your life and how that potentially propelled you to, to become a doctor and then on to an astronaut? Yeah. Um, you know, we could, we could honestly probably talk about this all for many hours. Yeah, I think you know that. Uh, but to distill it uh, in a way that I can express um, what that meant to me. I mean, let's, I don't want to take away from a lot of the sacrifices and suffering that people are going through even now. Uh, with current events around the world, with uh, on our daily lives, people are suffering. People have had a lot of losses from the pandemic, from even astronaut missions. There have been astronaut missions. There have been significant losses. Um, there are losses and sacrifices, loved ones everywhere. So, um, you know, the, the, the losses I've suffered are, are no more important than anyone else's. Um, I think it's important to just say that because I know I, I feel maybe a little bit guilty to talk about these, like um, maybe giving the impression that the only select few you had to have been in combat to have understand understand loss, uh, which is not at all true. But you are right; those losses were significant for me, and they, they were pretty formative. I was quite young in my adult life when those happened, and uh, both people were friends that I brothers that I loved dearly. And uh, in a lot of ways, I feel like I failed them. It's not something that I talk about a lot. And uh, in a lot of ways, it felt that a hole was created from those losses. I, I don't think that's uncommon. I think a lot of people, a lot of veterans feel that when they have left behind comrades overseas. And uh, you know, sometimes I've heard the expression that a little piece of me died there. Um, on that mountain or on that battlefield. And so I can understand the metaphor. I think for me, it just made me recognize maybe sometimes, maybe a little bit of the randomness and the luck that we have to be, to be alive, to be breathing, to, for a lot of other things. There are elements of luck. I don't really believe in luck as a tool to get you where you want to go. With success, I think if your strategy relies on luck that it's not a good strategy 
but there is a lot of luck in the experiences we've had. So I, I mean, I feel that a lot of luck or chance has come across my way, even as an adolescent, um, as a, certainly as a SEAL. Being, I mean, I've only had two platoons, so there's a, you know, there's a funny name for those of us who have only two platoons. But that's, in the grand scheme of things, is quite an experienced SEAL. Uh, but I feel very fortunate that in that short amount of time, I had a compressed experience of, of really extreme. Um, combat and, and, and the lessons that come with that. When Mark and Mike died and subsequent many, many other of our friends, all of our mutual friends have since died, there is an imperative, or at least for me, a hunger that was always there, but maybe more refined by those losses. And uh, I think for me that aspiration, that hunger to want to do good. And I think it's an important ingredient that is required for all success, whether it's medicine or politics or business or military leadership, is that level of aspiration and hunger. But it's hard to talk about it because I think that that is a close border, walks the line of ego and narcissism, which are poisons in any community. But if you don't have that hunger, that motivation, that deep-seated desire to succeed, it makes it hard to be super successful, to be super impactful in the way you want. And I think you can look in history that there have been a lot of people throughout human history that have had large impacts because they were extremely hungry people um, and, of course, were motivated, uh, were, were, were talented or had the resources as well. But... Um, that aspiration piece is an is a important ingredient. And so when Mark and Mike died, I felt that their losses helped refine some of the hunger that was always there, but maybe in a way where I wanted to do maximal good in the time I have left on this earth. And believe it or not, it wasn't, I didn't know what that looked like. And at the time it made sense because I was a combat medic and I had a lot of experiences with medicine. But that was an outlet to achieve the umbrella of what I wanted to do was impact and make this world a better place. And so naturally that led to medicine at the time, but it wasn't restricted to medicine. And so when people, I didn't go into medicine because I felt that, that it was the thing that I loved the most or it was from technical abilities what I, is what gave me the most pleasure. I found it as a tool to achieve ultimately what I wanted to do. And that's what led me to medicine. And in doing, doing that, I had never thought of becoming an astronaut or going to NASA. But the idea was planted. And only then that when I realized that, hey, pursuing a career with NASA as an astronaut and having that ability to impact a lot of people, the planet, space exploration, and just the next generation in general, that was completely consistent with what I wanted to do, what I felt that I was shaped to do after Mikey and Mark died and so that's i think probably that was a really long answer but probably the most distilled way i could explain how um my experiences with those with those two brothers i lost have shaped my life that is i i think and, and you said it and you said it beautifully is that your loss is no greater than anyone else's even if they lost a parent uh, in a hospital bed due, due to cancer but i think everyone struggles to 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 try to find meaning in their loss but i love how you just said it should fuel your hunger, your your inspiration to impact uh, others around you. And I know, again, given current events, uh, we're all looking back wondering if we we made a difference with our time served over there. But again, as you said, that's a, a much longer conversation for uh, behind closed doors and uh, and another day. Well, Johnny, I know we're we're coming to a. Uh, uh, a winding halt here, but uh, I, I've got two more questions for you because I, I, I'm so intrigued by this one. Again, NASA, man, you, you are an astronaut. That's, I mean, millions upon millions of little kids are saying when they grow up, I want to be an astronaut. And you've achieved what so few have. But I'm interested to hear your answer on this one. Do you consider NASA to be your defining moment in life? The short answer is no. But I'd like to expound upon that. I, for one, I think that you brag about me is, I think it's humbling, Mike, because I think you know, um, you should know 
how much I've learned and, and have looked up to you for many, many years and still continue to do. I have a problem when we measure ourselves, when we measure the importance of our lives by the careers we've had. I, I have a problem with that for many reasons um, because, I, I mean, I'm super passionate about what I do, what I do for NASA, but let's not forget I am, I am lucky. I am a blessed ambassador for what I get to do. There are thousands of other people who are just as good and just as deserving to do, to have the opportunities I have. And it's like that for a lot of other people in the world. And I think recognizing that humbles us. It keeps things in a, in a proper and safe perspective. The reason why it's hard for me to answer that question is because it suggests that, um, it suggests that we are measured by what we do in our lives, by, by, by the occupations we have, where in reality, we should be measured by the impact we have, the, the intensity impacts we have on other people. And I know scale is so easy to focus on, and it's certainly something that I have, I, I mean, I have focused on. I mean, if you look at it, my transition to medicine to here in large packs was because I felt that the scale at which I could do good was on a larger basis and have an opportunity I otherwise wouldn't have, a platform I otherwise wouldn't have, in, in addition to space exploration and serving the greater cause of improving our planet. But, you know, I made a promise to myself, and certainly after Mark and Mikey and others have passed away, that I will spend the rest of my life doing everything I humanly can to do good, to make tomorrow better than today. Um, to make the world a better place. I know it's a cliche way, it's a super cliche thing to say, but it is absolutely true. And so I know um, I'd like to spend as long as I can here at NASA, and I plan to as, as a professional astronaut and, and push that needle forward for space exploration. Um, but I certainly hope that I am not measured by any job I've ever had now in the past or in the future, because I know I'm not done and I know that the more important thing is the impacts we leave on other people, on our friends, on our family, and that they are then inspired to be a better human being to the next person. That's, I think that's what we should be measured at, measured, measured by, and we just don't do it enough. The uh, uh, wise man once said that the greatest currency in life is not money, it's impact. And, and Johnny, you at no point in, in your life should ever have to question that you've driven impact in the name of Mark, Mikey and uh, and Ryan, and you continue to do so, and you will continue to do so. And, and that's a great qu uh, transition to our last question here. This Truth Plus Tribe was sort of formed off the Everyday Warrior concept, which I write about in the Men's Journal. And these are just everyday warriors, such as, uh, as myself and yourself, just trying to make the most impact in life. What are the core tenets or what advice, the core tenets by which you've lived your life or what advice do you have for that mother of two that's just grinding, whose small victories are getting her children to school, getting to work and then picking them up? How do people find purpose and how do they find fulfillment and happiness? And I know that is a tough, tough question. It's a, it's a tough question. It's a really, it's a really good question. Um, I mean, it's like the million dollar question, right? I feel like if, if as adolescents, we can know the answer to this, then we can spend the next 60 to, you know, 80, maybe 80 years of our life working towards that. Um, but almost like the hardest thing of life is figuring out what we want to do or what impact we want to have. I, but I think the important ingredient in achieving that answer, uh, one, I think the only person that can answer that question is you. I don't think anyone can answer that question. Not your parents, not your friends, not society, not what you think society wants from you or your parents want from you, just you. And I think what you need is honesty. It's just to be honest with yourself on your desires, your fears, your apprehensions, what you want in this life. This life is short and we don't have any time to flounder or um, not, not march towards what we want to do in life. So whether that's, I mean, it doesn't really matter if it's pottery, if, it, if, if it's business, it's medicine, military, it doesn't matter what it is. 
but just got to be honest with what yourself and what you want. And I think that's probably the best way to find how you get to a purpose-driven life. And uh, I don't think the answer should really ever be clear. I don't think it's clear with me. Um, and I'm, I'm okay with that. As another wise man said, life is a mystery to be lived, not a puzzle to be solved. Johnny, great answer. Well, for all those listening, uh, I, I will say this, and I've not said this about any of my other guests. I probably uh, won't, even though they're all exceptional, great people that are close to me, and I love them all. Uh, I love this man for what he stands for. And I'm telling you, you will never meet a more compassionate, empathetic, amazing human being like Johnny Kim. Johnny, you are, and, and not to get uh, grandiose here, you are an inspiration, a, a, a bar for which we should all live our lives. Not in terms of the accomplishments you've had, but how you treat and respect other people. And it's been humbling, humbling to have you on. Johnny, where can people follow you best on, uh, on social media? I, I can't answer that question without saying this first. <laughs> uh, I don't think I deserve those words. And I, 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 I love you too, Mike. Um, to answer your question, I, I don't, I don't post as much as I, uh, as I should, uh, just cause it's time consuming. But, um, uh, Johnny Kim, I think if you just Google me, Johnny Kim, I think you might be able to find, on Twitter, and I, I think it's a great platform where I get to opportunity to share all the great things we do here at NASA and all the teamwork that goes on. Um, I could probably be, be a little bit better about that. Hey, well, Johnny, we'll follow what we can. We'll, we'll put that out for our listeners. I know I follow you on Instagram. Uh, when you do post or your team post for you, uh, they are interesting to watch as you're about to go into the water tank. So, Johnny, uh, we wish you the best. Keep rep representing our nation uh, like you do. And again, to the listeners, thank you for joining us. This has been another episode of Truth and Tribe. Thank you.